Hi everybody, it's Lindsay Baker here with the Action Hour. And today my guests are John Flores and Allison Burton. And they are they have a firm called Firm Tofu. It's a graphic design and marketing firm. Is that right, you guys? That's yes, different. that's correct. Yeah. And you guys are here today to give us some really interesting information. Do you guys in the audience want to learn how to speak chicken? Because that's exactly what you're going to learn today. So <laughs> we are going to hear from these experts. And you guys are experts because why? Why? Because? I mean, I really wouldn't say that we're experts. Um, we just decided to take hope in. And we've learned so much about chicken care just by volunteering at sanctuaries. Um, and yeah, we just want to show people how easy it is to care for chickens. Because you live with one every day, is that correct? Yes, we live yeah. with one. Yeah, this is yeah. And so now, where did all these chickens come from? For the people that haven't seen or kept up with this, and shame on them, because I've done about three or four shows on this rescue. There are actually 600 chickens rescued. John, you guys were in instrumental in this. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that part? And we'll go from there. Oh, we got a little mic back, aren't we? Oh, all right, go ahead. It's all good. So, um, yeah, thanks for mentioning the recent chicken rescue. That was, you know, a really, really massive rescue. Yeah, close to 700 chickens were rescued from a farm in NorCal. Um, but basically, um, you know, I always invite people to work in areas of their influence. So things that you can do something about, you know, we always hear about these things that are happening in third world countries or other states or other countries. And you just feel disempowered hearing about that thing because you want to do something, but yeah, you're so far away. So I always encourage people um, in my household as well uh, to, if something comes across your peripherals or your uh, something catches your attention, I always invite them to really check in if that's something that they can, um, you know, partake in or even take action on. And uh, with the recent chicken rescue, it was a perfect example of something coming into my area of influence, which I then took action on. And, uh, you know, it wasn't, it was very, uh, I get it, it was a lot, but we had a, a good team behind the work as well. So, you know, I can't take the full credit, as you know, you you uh, interview many people um, in NorCal, um, sanctuaries that don't want to be disclosed and et cetera, et cetera. So definitely, you know, always work in the area of influence. And if we can save a life, you know, why not take action? Oh, your mic is muted. We have a, uh, we have a video. And that was one of the sanctuaries that took a, a number of the chickens, some over 200 there, as we saw. So we do want to talk about Happy Hen as well. Let's just show a couple of uh, slides of Happy Hen. So this is the Happy Hen Sanctuary. Is You want to talk a little bit about what, uh, what goes on at Happy Hen and what the, it's like there? I'm going to turn my mic off for this grad. Okay. Um, so yeah, thanks for mentioning Happy Hand. They were definitely a pivotal uh, sanctuary that took part in the recent rescue. Um, and uh, I haven't visited Happy Hand yet, uh, although I do know Zoe. Uh, she does amazing work out there in NorCal. Um, anytime that there is uh, a place uh, where animals need to go temporarily, for instance, for these chickens, you know, she always steps up. So I really appreciate 
you know, people, she's already doing so much work. So I really value um, sanctuaries that step up, even if they have their plate full, they always have, they all, somehow they always find room uh, to house chickens, either be temporarily or for, find, you know, the, chi the uh, chickens, uh, they find their forever homes. I know they're going to adopt a few. Um, I'm not sure exactly the uh, exact amount, but um, yeah, it's, uh, we needed a place for the chickens to go and Happy Hand stepped up. Another sanctuary to mention is uh, Charlie's Acres in NorCal as well. They were very instrumental in the last part of the uh, chicken rescue where um, I'm so happy to have made their acquaintance before the rescue. And I contacted them say, hey, we need we need uh, transporters. Are you able to step up? And they and they did. Um, so they were able to uh, go to the farm where the chickens were and um, transport the hundreds of chickens that are now at the uh, Happy Hand in NorCal. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, there are a lot of different organizations and we want to, uh, too many to mention, I'm going to forget some of them here, but go back and watch the videos. We, I think we did videos on just about everyone that participated in that rescue. And we thank them also very much as far as who stepped up and took the chickens from there. And I'm sorry, we're having a little trouble where I'm having to mute you or me or else it's really crackly. So um, what I'd like to do now is have you guys tell your story about your little friend there, Hope, if you would. Yeah, so um, we're unmuted. Um, so... Hope was brought in, here she is, um, as a little baby chick uh, to Kindred Spirits, which is a sanctuary that we volunteer at. It's a wonderful sanctuary. Um, and Hope was rescued off a slaughter truck. Um, she is what they consider a meat chicken. Um, basically, they're bred to get really fat really quick, and it's, you know, really bad for their health. Um, and so activists were able to rescue her off a slaughterhouse truck. Um, and the law allows us to do that because um, she was injured. Basically, whenever there's an injured animal, um, the law does allow us to rescue the animals. Um, so Hope was very, very sick. Uh, she had parasites. She had a big wound on her side. Um, and she needed intensive care. Uh, so... I was already head over heels in love with chickens at that point, and I saw this little tiny baby come in, and I could not resist. I volunteered to take her in. I'm like, I don't, I don't know anything about chickens, but I will take care of her. Just tell me what to do. Um, and you know, it was such a go for a while. It was, you know, we had to give her medication, uh, clean her wound, all that stuff. Um, but now, about nine months later, she's strong and healthy and active and not overweight anymore um and you know she's really opened her eyes to the joys of having chickens and uh she's so intelligent she talks to us she tells us what she wants she's she's assigned names to us uh, she's really just a joy to have in this house and I'm really grateful that i rescued her so um now do you mind me asking i'm gonna have to turn uh, do you mind me asking how you, you know, do you live in an apartment? Do you live in a condo? Do you live in a townhouse? I mean, it would seem to me that you would have to have at least a, you want to have a yard. Yeah, it looks like you have her indoors. And I'm going to give you a couple of questions because of the mic situation. But you also mentioned you live with other animals. So maybe you guys can talk about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we live in a house. Um, we do have a backyard, but um, what we want to share with people is that you don't have to have a backyard. Basically, chickens just need access um, to dirt and sun maybe three times a week. Um, so if there's a spot you can take a chicken or they can take a dirt bath and a sun bath. That's really all they need. Um, Hope wears diapers. Let's see if I can show that. Yeah, there we go. Her little dinosaur. Diaper. <laughs> hey, guess what? Chicken butt. <laughs> 
that allows her to live inside with us. Uh, she she's gonna go for a walk now. <laughs> she's definitely got a mind of her own. Um, I'd say she's probably pretty similar to having a cat. Um, they have their own mind. That they <laughs> they want to do their own things and. Um, and they're very vocal as well. Chickens are very vocal. Living with chickens, you, um, or even if you don't have the capacity to, or haven't even met a chicken, uh, you know, visit your local sanctuary and get to know them because, you know, often people say that animals don't have voices. Well, that kind of like bugs me a lot because they do. It's the, the fact that humans are, you know, we've become, I guess we kind of like dumb ourselves down to not want to recognize that they do have language, but they actually do have language just like your dog or your cat um, or any other animal that you you met, guinea pig, uh, you know, chickens, they have language as well and they have voices. We just got to be intelligent enough. <laughs> we say humans are intelligent, but we got to be intelligent enough to recognize that they do have language and hope, you know, living with hope for the past, what, almost a year, nine months, uh, we've uh, recognized that, you know, chickens have, you know, you spoke about chicken language while chickens have their own language. They're very vocal. Um, you know, oftentimes, and speaking of language, oftentimes um, roosters, for instance, are given a bad rap because they're loud. So, you know, they have a voice, but we're like, oh, they're just too loud. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, living with hope, we've uh, learned that chickens just like any other animal has, they have language, they have a voice. Yeah. And, yeah, in regards to um, the uh, the whole living situation, we know vegans that live in apartments with chickens. We know people that- Let me ask have, you like, a question a about setting. that. Let's be, like, let's just be really uh, afraid. It is a little bit harder, I would imagine. I mean, what are the laws about allowing you to have a chicken in an apartment? Is that, you know? I'm not sure that yeah. that's, that's easy. So we don't want to, you know, talk people into it. That might not, that might be one hope. But if you're in a house, you know, and do you think people will get more than one chicken? Do you think, I mean, when you have a chicken, do you, is it kind of nice to have a group or how does that work out? Yeah, I would recommend at least two chickens um, because they are pack animals um, with hope. You know, she was rescued as a sick chicken, a sick chick, and we could not have her around anyone else, or we would make other chickens sick as well. So she grew up being a single chicken, and um, she definitely needs that interaction. Um, so we're we're her pack, pretty much, we're her flock. So we provide that daily interaction, daily stimulation. She follows us around, talking to us. Um, chickens definitely need um, that interaction and, and companionship. So um, either like be prepared to really be there for a chicken or have multiple chickens, which is a great, great thing to do. Yeah. And to talk about the whole like laws regarding having chickens, um, as far as I know, there are housing um, or zoning laws that uh, kind of uh, discourage uh, people having roosters. Oftentimes people... Uh, you know, maybe you have a, a, a rescue rooster and, um, you know, your neighbor complains. Well, through, through um, learning about chickens, I've learned that roosters have the same decibel range, like the same loudness as your dog barking. So it's no different than having a dog. Um, and oftentimes, too, I, I don't encourage it, but I don't discourage it at the same time. But oftentimes I come across, especially in the animal rescue world, you have people... Uh, I'm not going to mention any names, but we have certain people breaking their contract by rescuing dogs or adopting fosters, whether it be cats or dogs. So, like, why not consider doing the same for chickens? Because chickens, uh, there are um, about 9 billion chickens killed uh, per year. Uh, and the, the number continues to skyrocket. And as you know, Lindsay, uh, covering this uh, these chicken re rescue stories, a lot of the times farmers... Although they, they want to not kill the chickens, but it's inevitable because it's in their contract of, hey, like they have a contract, they make a contract between uh, humans and the animals. And the contract is after a certain amount of time, uh, the farmer needs to make a decision on culling the animals or killing them or gassing them or 
whatever methods that they use. And um, because why are they making? What do you mean they have a contract with the animals? Yeah. So like in the that. in typically in their contract, um, they have a contract. What I mean by that is that uh, the the agreement um, for having a farm, whether it be like a free range, cage free um, farm, they have a certain, uh, the chickens have a certain amount of time before they're seen as spent. And after they are seen, as, uh, you know, there's a, imagine living your life where, uh, on, you know, it's marked on a calendar the day that you're going to be sent to slaughter. That's, that's what happens with chickens. They have a calendar date that as soon as that calendar date, day comes across the farmer's peripherals they have to make a decision on uh, killing them or not and with the recent rescue stories i know the farmers you know multiple farmers wanted didn't want to kill the animals so they wanted to adopt although that's a kind gesture oftentimes um people don't recognize that by the farmers giving away the chickens now the um the care is left into uh, you know citizens, you know law-abiding citizens, which they don't, city folk don't know. <laughs> they know hardly anything about chickens, and that's what we find oftentimes: um, chickens um, inside, uh, you know, our our um, you know rescue groups, or even the uh, what are those places called where they keep animals? The the shelters, the animal shelters, you know the. Oftentimes chickens are found in animal shelters and the vets don't know what to do with the chickens. Yeah. So oftentimes, you know, chickens, not only are they euthanized because their contract comes up, but they're also euthanized in our shelter systems as well. So it kind of creates this perpetuance and kind of like uh, perpetuates the, the systematic violence that goes on. So that's what, which is why we're here today is we want to normalize chicken companionship because chickens are the most killed land animal um, in America, even worldwide, chickens are just kind of like forgotten about, and we come across, you know, people telling us, "Oh, chick, well, who, why care about chickens? They, they don't have." A I know. Yeah. Allison's come across people doing activism. People. Telling it's a big that misconception that out, that chickens are dumb, and it's 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 put out there so that people feel better about killing them because somehow. If they are not uh, smart in their minds, they're thinking if they're not smart, they're not. Uh, it's not. It's okay to kill them. So that's part of the fallacy that goes on about chickens. But um, some of the things that I think are interesting that if people are going to have them as pets, um, we want to talk about the care of chickens. So I had a couple of books that you uh, were talking about. This one in particular. The Chicken Health Handbook. So, uh, you want to talk about that for a moment? Um, yeah, it's a fantastic book. Um, this is definitely like a deep dive into um, anything chick anything chickens may experience. I'm still like halfway into it, <laughs> um, but it's it's really good to have um, whenever uh, your chicken may be experiencing some symptoms or anything like that. Um, it's a good way to understand what your chicken's needs are and to properly care for their health. Um, but even more important than that is having a good avian vet in your area. Um, and uh, you can definitely find one we can help you out with that. Um, but yeah, it's good that you need to have a good doctor and also know how to care for chickens. Yeah. And oftentimes too, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that Allison, where um, it's very specific that you to find an avian vet because you can find a vet anywhere but they don't necessarily know how to deal with um, birds or exotic animals. But if you can't find an avian vet, an exotic animal vet will do. They typically come across all sorts of animals, lizards, dragons, et cetera. So if you can't find an avian vet, a, um, an exotic animal vet will do. Yeah, and we can share a link on uh, vets that do currently treat chickens as well. Yeah, we want to add some links in. Uh, we'll be adding links in at the end. I have several uh, Happy Hen Sanctuary link and the organization that we'll talk about in a moment here, uh, Open Sanctuary, where people can go for training. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But one point I wanted to make is that, you know, until we stop breeding chickens, the problem is, I mean, how many can sanctuaries take? And I believe they live something like 20 years. Is that true? They can.
Yeah. If well taken care for and not exploited, yeah. yeah. So these people that are working in this field, you know, this is perfect because I have to let this young man that I know on another social media outlet know about this because he's saying how humanely he he treats them and he he showed them taking dust baths and you know he showed the the pens he has them in and they're they're quite nice and everything but you know after they lay a certain amount of eggs he said he's going to try and give them away same thing thinking that's being humane but you know these people need to know where are they all going to go you know that's the thing so do you, you want to talk about that you. for a second yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the breeding of animals because, yeah, oftentimes you can see it all over social media. These influence, quote unquote, influencers that just share um, on their gram, like all these cute little fl fluffy uh, chickens. And, you know, I I've heard recent stories about, I think it's the USPS that ships live chickens and they have to account for a certain amount because like throughout the shipment, you know, when they're being the, the chickens or the eggs are being shipped, some break and some even some chickens, some live chickens even suffocate. So they, they have to consider that part of like a business loss, quote unquote. So do you want to touch upon the, the breeding of chickens a little bit? Yeah, I mean, well, that's that's a huge thing. I mean, that's kind of the main way that chickens that people buy chickens is through the mail. And yeah, it's an enormous loss. Like. Uh, people will order like 12 chicks and maybe a cup, maybe two will survive. It's, it's atrocious. You know, these chickens are no different than other animals. They need a mommy. They need to be cared for. They need love. And it's so often that our, that the industry just treats them like property. It's really disgusting. Yeah. And chicken breeding is no different than dog breeding. I know people on this channel and watching, I know, they are um, they are against the breeding of dogs because, as you know, like there's just so many um, stray animal problems. You know, even with cats, so kind of you know, it's as prolif uh, um, prolific as that is. And oftentimes, with the breeding of chickens, there there comes across um, using animals as entertainment or aka cockfighting, which happens especially in Los Angeles. There's so many investigations that are uh, you know ongoing on uncovering there was a recent cockfighting ring that was uh, exposed by PETA for instance and this is you know just because PETA is not un you know uncovering it or exposing it doesn't mean it, it doesn't exist they exist and it's an ongoing problem because we're normalizing by um, we're normalizing chicken breeding or even animal breeding when we say oh cute animal can I have one you know I I before being vegan, I know you, I used to want like, you know, exotic dogs and all these other things, but then being exposed to the information and doing my homework, you can see how horrific and horrendous, you know, animal breeding is because it creates so much problems for not only animals, but human humans as well. We have a huge stray animal problem, especially in Los Angeles. And there's so many organizations that are popping up that are trying to do the, the good work. And it's just it's a surmounting amount of work that no no amount of organizations can uh, tackle unless we talk about breeding. So I'm glad that you bring up that topic. Yeah. Thank you. And um, I want to just get into some of these other topics here. Uh, so there's actually quite a bit to learn about chickens because you say here you have breed specific needs. Uh, so, oh, and then how to manage poop. I guess you told us that. I think one of the things, so I'm going to give you a few things to talk about, uh, that scares people. One of the things that really worries people is the salmonella scare. So that's a good one. Uh, what to do with the eggs. If Assuming now, are you only adopting out to vegans? Right? So, yeah. So, uh, you, you dress the noise level. Oh, and interact with other animals. Like I have cats and I have dogs uh, and others do as well. My cat's here trying to sabotage this whole thing. Okay, I'm going to give you the mic. Here you go. Awesome. Thanks, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so yeah, to keep track of all those questions. Um, so breed specific, um, it's gonna relate mostly to two different types of chickens uh, primarily. Um, so Hope, um, I don't know where she went, but Hope is a, a Cornish cross. Uh, so Cornish crosses specifically uh, need uh, a very restricted diet because if you give them even a little too much food, they'll just balloon. Like they're bred to just balloon out of control and they'll get to the point where they can't walk and then it gets way worse because um, they're just sitting there. Um, so it's highly important with Cornishes. Um, and then the other thing is the egg layers. Um, egg layers, pretty much egg laying is very exhausting for chickens. Um, it's as if you had your period every day. You can imagine how exhausting that would be. And it's, you know, they go through labor and it takes hours and they have to like sit there and push through it and it's painful. Um, and it's, it's not a fun experience. A lot of people think of eggs as just like a chicken pooping. and <laughs> It's not the case. Um, so if egg layers, um, they need their, they need the nutrition that goes into the eggs. They need it fed back to them. Um, basically the calcium that forms the shell around their egg, it comes from their bones. Um, <laughs> um, and so it's, it's very depleting for their bodies, as you can imagine, you know, if your body's taking calcium from your bones every day. Um, so they need, um, not only do they need their eggs fed back to them, but they also need a calcium supplement and a phosphorus supplement. Um, all of that's in the chicken health book. Um, and that's something that we're, you know, open and willing to help anyone um, with if they want to adopt one of the chickens. Um, yeah, and in regards to you know egg laying, um, so with chicken anatomy, or, <laughs> with chicken anatomy, um, so y'all gonna learn about chickens today <laughs> if, you, if you're not listening already. But um, so with uh, chicken anatomy, what's interesting about chickens is that their um, uh, uterus and their anus um, they converge, which what is called a cloaca or cloaca. And that's where they poop, the same hole where they poop, they also lay eggs. And that kind of touches upon the issue of salmonella, is that although some salmonella, um, uh, you, know, ex, you know, humans being exposed to salmonella, some of it is healthy, but with eating eggs, it's like it's, it's over the top because salmonella is found in nature. But when we introduce eating of animals and their byproducts, that that amount of salmonella is just, it's through the roof so that's why you hear people getting sick and that's why we hear of like you know recalls of food items or like spinach or lettuce is because the um the animal the agriculture industry uses animal agriculture uh, and using manure you know chicken poop and as you know with the um, the conditions that these animals are in free range cage free doesn't matter it, you know, all of it is horrendous and they're sickly animals, you know, they're already sick. So introducing that into our food system, they get sick. Yeah. So basically the way to avoid salmonella is don't eat their eggs. Yeah. <laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, obvious things like if you're handling bird poop, don't, you know, don't go touching your food, wash your hands first, you know. Take the precautions that we're already taking right now with COVID. Don't touch your face, basically. Yeah. Right. And, you know, a lot of people have parrots. I had a parrot for years. Um, and uh, so you had to deal with bird poop and people, they never say anything about that because it's, it's a normalized pet, but a chicken, everybody laughs. You're like, oh, you're going to get a chicken ha, 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 as a pet. Um, I guess the one thing you didn't mention is, tr oh, two, I have another question too. I had a parrot, as I said, and it wasn't easy to get I tried putting a leash on him. It went around like a halter and, you know, to take him to Central Park. At the time I was living in New York. Uh, but so how do you get the chicken to wear the diaper? That's number one. The second question that we didn't cover was travel with the chicken. Okay, there you go. Um, real quick, I wanted to touch on one other question that we haven't answered yet, which is uh, having other animals. Um, yeah. <laughs> Basically, um, it depends on the animal that you have. Um, you'll know if you have an animal that's very much a hunter and if they may hunt your chickens, but for the most part, it's not an issue. 
we have four dogs, um, all ranging in size from a little tiny nine pounder to our beagle, who's close to 30 pounds. Um, they pretty much are afraid of her. She's the alpha chicken. <laughs> <laughs> they leave her alone. They don't see her as food. Yeah, the roles change where she's, you know, she's the boss. You know, oftentimes you hear about, like, you know, dogs being very territorial. Well, <laughs> yeah. you know, Hope's saying, hey, like, leave me alone. Like, I'll tell you what's up. Like, hey, I'm, I'm the queen here of the house. <laughs> and we have friends. We have uh, friends that have a pit bull, and there's no problem with their chickens. We have other friends that have cats and no problems. Um, so, obviously, chickens aren't going to be okay with all animals, but... So far, with everyone we know, there hasn't been a problem. Um, okay, the other thing, diapers. Um, Hope, originally, you know, we started diapers on her when she was really young. Um, and at first, like, she had trouble walking. She would kind of walk backwards for a while when she was wearing her diaper. Um, but uh, with time, she got used to it, and now it's, it's no big deal. Now she knows that when we change her diaper, she's going to get a meal. So she'll follow us to the bathroom and wait, eagerly await her changing. She's, she's so good about it. Yeah. <laughs> and um, touching upon the diapers that we, um, that we use for Hope, um, what's great about the diapers that she's currently using is that uh, they're sourced from vegans that also happen to have a, a, a chicken sanctuary, a rooster sanctuary. So you were... We're trying to, um, you know, normalize chicken companionship and normalize, you know, the supporting of animal sanctuaries that do the the great rescue work. Yeah, we'll add that link as well. It's a uh, chicken knickers, and their sanctuary is Rooster House. Um, and then, let's see, your other question was traveling. Um, you know, there aren't there aren't seatbelts for chickens. Um, so basically, um, in our day to day travels, um, I'll just sit in the back seat and hold on to her. Um, but other options are carriers, um, no different than like a cat carrier or anything like that. Um, I also recently got a backpack, <laughs> <laughs> um, one of those pet carrier backpacks with the, the little uh, window. And so she'll be riding in that when we go on hikes, when it gets a little cooler. That's great. Um, wow. So it's almost like any other pet. And I saw you had a leash. Someone had a leash on a ticket which I thought was really interesting. I'd never seen that, but, and it's interesting. How did you find a diaper to fit a baby chicken? And where do you buy chicken diapers? There we go. Um, yeah, well, um, Hope happens to be a very large chicken. So even like the tiny chicken diapers fit her as a baby. Um, but there are whole companies dedicated to bird diapers. Um, Avian Fashions was my first go-to. Yeah, um, because uh, we have cockatiels. I've had cockatiels for all my life, um, and we used to get diapers for them. So we have a whole collection of avian fashion diapers from them. Um, so that we started with them, and then we learned about um, Rooster House uh, slash uh, Chicken Makers, um, and their diapers are just fantastic. And their customer service is great as well. You can reach out to them and. Tell them your, you know, the age of your chicken and the breed, and they'll help you figure out which size works best. Yeah. So does that mean that there's like uh, people? There are actually, I guess, uh, vendors that are making like chicken diapers. So are there vendors that are making chicken coops? I mean, that you put in your house. So where does she stay? in someone's house, where would you have her in your house? And does she go through the whole house and all of that? Excellent question. Um, she currently, um, at night she sleeps in a, uh, what do you call it? A, a dog, dog crate. crate. Yeah. Um, but we have other friends, their chickens don't even sleep in anything. They just um, go to the closet. Chickens have very built in roosting behaviors um, at, a certain time every night they're going to go to their sleep spot and that's where they're going to be the whole night. Um, most chickens, aside from Cornishes, will perch up on a little stick. Um, so basically all you need is um, maybe some puppy pads to catch their poop um, and a perch. Um, but, you know, we feel safer having her in a dog crate. Um, and we just have puppy pads in there for the night. She sleeps in there. Um, and she'll even, like, go in there. Like, if she's had a long day, 
and it's before her bedtime she'll just go in and be like i'm done yeah <laughs> she'll put herself to sleep <laughs> she'll tuck herself in <laughs> so yeah and then so during the daytime she has free range of the entire house and when it cools off i do my best to uh, which is hilarious actually i'll start with the beginning of the day um, so they do, you know, we, we change her and we feed her. And then, so I do my morning ritual. And the first thing that I do is, uh, go outside and I just hear these little footsteps running right behind me. So she's, she's chasing after me to go outside, but right now it's so ungodly hot that, you know, I don't want her to be exposed to the hot weather. So we wait until the end of the day to have her have some free range out in the backyard. So here's a picture of you with Hope, and I guess hens give snuggles just like cats and dogs. That's very sweet. Um, the, we didn't talk about the open sanctuary a, a lot yet, so let's go into that a little bit, okay? Uh, talk about what it is, how it got formed, and what the resources for people that want to really do this and have companion animal chickens. Yeah, so Open, Open Sanctuary is a fantastic resource. Um, it's one of the few, very, very few uh, resources out there for vegan sanctuaries that will give you actual information on caring for chickens. Um, some information, like for example, in the biology book, will say things that like uh, chickens eating eggs is a sign of sickness. That's not true at all. Um, and so Open Sanctuary is really like your one-stop source for accurate information uh, when it comes to really caring for animals, not just um, setting them up to, you know, provide good meat or good eggs or anything like that. Um, truly caring for animals and caring for them into their old age, things like that. Um, so it's, it's a fantastic resource. Um, they have courses on chickens. They even have specialized courses on um, like large breed care, like hope. And they also have courses on other animals as well. Um, so it's, it's really just a fantastic resource. Couldn't recommend it enough. You're muted, Lindsay. Can't hear me. Okay, that's really good for people to know. And then we have chlorophyll also. Are you guys familiar with their program at all? You are? Okay, let me put you back on the mic. So yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah, we recently took her um, advanced uh, chicken care class. It was really informative, really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, I guess what I really, really liked about it was the um, chicken first aid kit information. Mm -hmm. um, I know that will be useful. Um, I just got, our, I'm all excited. I just got our box for our chicken first aid kit. Um, and I'm looking forward to building it out. Um, and ultimately my goal is to have a chicken sanctuary. So this is, you know, a large step towards that. Yeah, my mic is off and your mic is on. Okay, wow, so we've got, we've got just a few more minutes here. Uh, no, no, we got another 10, 15 minutes here. So what else can you, would you guys like to talk about? Um, want to talk about Happy Hen a little bit in the sanctuary and what they do and why people should donate. You want to talk about that for a moment? Yeah. So um, currently with the recent rescue, um, there are about 80 uh, spent egg layer chickens that still need to be adopted out. Um, and we've worked um, tirelessly. We have, I know Jane's been working on it um, and some other uh, activists in Los Angeles where we've kind of already are tapped with um, finding homes for them in California and uh, Northern states like Washington and Oregon. So currently right now, any amount of care, um, you know, whether it be you, if you're near San Luis Obispo, you know, to go, if, to go help out Zoe, um, do so in that way if you can't make a donation, but any amount of donation um, that you send, send their way will help because we, we anticipated uh, for the hands to be there uh, no more than two weeks, but now it's been like uh, close to two months. Um, so if there's any sanctuaries like in Oregon or uh, even micro sanctuaries, 
Uh, but other sanctuaries in, in the surrounding states are kind of tapped out with um, with uh, having homes for chickens. As you know, chickens being the, the most cold animal, uh, land animal in America. So we're, that's why we, we're on here today is to normalize the chicken companionship. So Zoe has a great adoption program right now where she's vetting um, people, individuals, um, where she asks them questions like, you know, what's your intent behind uh, adopting this chicken, you know, are you going to eat their eggs? You know, do you plan, you know, to kill them for their meat, et cetera, et cetera. Questions like that. So she has a really well-rounded vetted um, uh, adoption program happening right now. And they can definitely use um, financial help as well. So you can find them on Instagram and their webpage. Uh, and it's, it seems to be, it's fairly simple to make a donation. So five yeah. bucks helps. Uh, a dollar feeds chicken for one day, or probably even less than that. So 30 bucks goes a long way to feed a whole flock. Um, so yeah, you know, there, if you have the capacity to donate, do so. If you have the capacity to go there and uh, give your time, please do so as well. And if you can't, I mean, if you can't donate, one of the things that you can do is share out this video, do a watch party, get the word out, because the more sanctuaries that see it, Possibly they can take on some of the chickens. That's an opportunity. Also, um, other people might be able to make a donation. And when you go on there, you know, whether they're on Facebook or any of their social media and comment, that also helps them to get up into, you know, higher listings and then more people will see them. So just put your love out there any way you can help out. That would be so appreciated. Okay, guys, anything else you want to share uh, with us right now? I'm going to give you the mic. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, at this point, um, with all the sanctuaries being pretty much tapped out for space, we're just trying to raise awareness that anyone can have chickens in their home, um, especially hens. You know, they're quiet. They're they're so sweet and loving. You know, you saw that picture. They're very cuddly. They purr when they're happy. Um, they're, they're wonderful companions. They're very intelligent um even their feed is like super affordable um so you know this go out to all the vegans watching this consider bringing some chickens in your home yeah and we'll help you yeah. you know figure out how to take care of chickens because you know we're fairly new to this but there's you know tons of resources and other vegans that have chickens that we can we can help you out yeah reach out to us we'll make it happen it's a it's a vegan chicken community yeah of chicken parents that's yeah. very cool yeah. there was one other yeah there was one other book that how to speak chicken you want to talk about that for a moment yeah that's it's a wonderful book it's it's a quick read i highly recommend it to everyone it's a great dive into understanding chicken psychology and just their rich world of communication with each other and with humans and it's it's honestly mind blowing. Like it's, I recommend that book to everyone. It will really wake you up to just how intelligent chickens are and how rich and complex their language is. And it's something I found really interesting is that you can take two chickens from two flocks that I've never met and they will speak the same language and they'll understand each other, which I think is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, the only thing we haven't talked about is your business, Home Tofu. You want to talk about that for a moment? Yeah, of course. So we have a creative firm uh, by the name of Firm Tofu. It originated from a, um, a college concept from uh, Allison's college. And we kind of expanded it ever since her graduating. Um, and... Uh, we love it. We we love basically, you know, we're a purpose driven company um, and business. Our ethics align with who we are. We um, we have clients that are uh, vegan and only vegan. We also uh, employ vegans as well. So we give out the work. You know, there's tons of creatives out there. And especially during these times, we like to give out work to um, other vegan creatives. And some of the work, Lindsay, I know you mentioned you wanted to hear about some of the work that we've done. Uh, we've worked with like various sanctuaries in LA and we've also even uh, this work here, <laughs> yeah, exactly. this logo with Jane and Chain News, we created that, we branded um, Jane and Chain News where we, uh, you know, Allison 
using her expertise in design, she created a, a ba basically an outline of how to apply the logo to various outlets where, you know, wherever, whether it be collateral or websites, you know, we, we specialize in that. Um, although we are taking like a brief, like break from our work, you know, it, it seems to me that we're always trying to, um, you know, do our best either volunteering or if we can even provide uh, a little bit of guidance in regards to um, consultancy work, we can, you know, we can, we can uh, help out in that capacity right now. But yeah, that's a little bit about us. We do websites, branding, um, billboards. Uh, billboards. We've, Allison was actually part of the, um, a while back, I think two years ago, the um, huge In Defense of Animals campaign, uh, Ditch Dairy, which was uh, featuring Aaron Janice's video, uh, The Dairy is Scary. Allison was, played a big role in that in getting the billboards out. So that's kind of, that's some of our work that we've done as well. And uh, we all, yeah, we always make it an uh, initiative to either volunteer our work or uh, share other amazing work from other vegan creatives as well. That is awesome. So I don't know if you know, but I, I was a graphic designer for years and I worked in New York and in LA and I taught at the Art Institute and then I taught I actually am just finishing my tenure at uh, Rocky Mountain. I'm going to take a sabbatical. So I teach graphic design, branding, all of that. So funny, it's a small world. But yeah, so great to have you guys on. So uh, any last words? We're going to wrap things up now. And just wondered if you had any last words you wanted to share. So go ahead. Chickens are friends, not food. Yeah, chicken, <laughs> chickens are individuals just like your dog or your cat. So consider uh, reaching out and adopting chickens. There are many chickens that need our help. And uh, yeah, we're here to be a resource. Yeah. Thanks so much for having us on today, Lindsay. Yeah, Appreciate thank you, it. Lindsay. Oh, you're so welcome. And yeah, guys, if anybody needs graphic design work, branding, whatever, uh, hire other vegans. And those of you that aren't vegan, hire vegans. <laughs> become vegan uh so yeah so definitely and maybe we can all get together at some point and do a massive campaign to help normalize chickens as pets why not you know as companion not pets companion animals we should say all right so even though to test out the scratchiness let's just all say goodbye to everyone hey everybody i will be back next week i will be back saturday with an amazing show so you have to wait to find out what that is and then next tuesday same time same place we'll see you then thank you for watching bye, bye. bye. thank you